Welcome back to Looking at Picture Books. It's been a while since the last episode, but I've got a very special guest to start season two. I'm going to be talking to Nicola Kent about her latest book, Grumpy Hat, which is all about what happens when a little dog called Ravi gets stuck in a bad mood and he can't get out of it. I'm going to show you some of the pages of the book first, then I'll have a chat to Nicola. And I'm just going to mention before you meet Nicola that she's got a very quiet voice and it's because of a childhood illness. But if you listen carefully, she's got a lot of very interesting things to say about how the story came to be and how she put together the artwork. So let's have a look at the book first. <laughs> Nicola, lovely to see you and thank you for coming to talk to me about your beautiful book Grumpy Hat. And thank you very much for having me Jane and I hope can you hear me okay? I can, I can hear you very well thanks Nicola and it's interesting that sometimes a quiet voice can be heard perfectly well and it's interesting I remember you mentioning to me once that when you go on school visits your quiet voice has the children sitting absolutely entranced and perfectly silent. Yeah, so it's interesting. I've had um, problems with my airway since a childhood illness and um, it can be a bit scary going into schools because you think, oh, they're going to be loud and I won't be able to get them to be quiet. But actually, they're fascinated. And once I explain, they, they really listen because, because they have to. So... Um, yeah, it's quite an interesting lesson about shouting. <laughs> exactly, oh, very interesting. Yeah. I'm all for not shouting. Yeah, um, and also recently I had the opportunity to um, spend World Book Day with the Everly in our children's hospital school. And that just felt really valuable to show, you know, young people and children who were having a really difficult time being ill, that... Um, even if your education is disrupted and your childhood disrupted with illness, you can go on and realise your dreams. So I hope that's also a good thing for children to see. I'm sure you're a great example to them. So let's talk a little bit about the development. Should we start with the development of the story and how the idea came to be and then how it developed from there? I mean, it's always really difficult to remember how ideas form because often they're they just pop up on a walk and then you scribble something down. But one of the things I love about picture books is the way pictures can become metaphor and you can create these really bizarre universes that kind of make absolute sense in the context of the book. So here I wanted the hat to represent this terrible mood and that felt important because it's kind of telling children if you're feeling grumpy or angry, it's not you, it's this extra bit to you. So through the course of the story, the hat becomes bigger and bigger and itchier and stickier. The worse Ravi's mood gets, but then at the end, he does manage to get rid of that. So yeah, I just think that's a really fun thing you can do with picture books. It is. And it's interesting. I read this one recently to my under fives art group. And before I read it to them, I was wondering if it would be a bit too sophisticated a concept for them. I don't know why I thought that, but I was completely wrong. They completely got it and they loved it. It went down extremely well. That's really lovely to hear. Um, I've heard from a lot of teachers that they're using it as a kind of bit of a way of talking about self-care. And in fact, I've got a friend who's got a son and a daughter and she actually has used the book as a kind of like a self 
outlook when the older son was in a really grumpy mood, trying all the things, you know, have a bath, eat something nice, go in the garden, all the things that as adults we're still needing to remember that if we're feeling a bit down. Exactly, it's like a manual for all of us really, because everybody experiences those moods sometimes. Um, So you've sent through lots of wonderful pictures showing the process of um, the development of the book. Um, There's some pencil roughs and then there's some lovely pictures that start experimenting with materials. And I know you used a slightly unusual type of paint for this book. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. So um, I'd met up with um, Pam Smy, who was my one of my tutors on the wonderful Cambridge School of Art MA in Children's Book Illustration. And Pam sort of been a real mentor to me. And she introduced me to work with little green paints, emulsion paints. So it's what you would normally paint your room with. And they've just got this lovely, I mean, they're lovely colours, first of all, but they've got a lovely, thick, quite crude um, sort of character to them. So my previous books were in watercolour and ink. And it was really fun to be forced to be looser and bolder by these, um, by these paints. And the way I did it was I painted them all in separate layers and separate sections and then collaged them digitally, which makes a sort of printmaking effect, really, so you get the little overlaps and so on. And I noticed one of the images you sent through, well, there was some where you were testing all the different colours and working out your colour palette. And then there's one where you've put all the different samples into Photoshop and you've overlapped them like a stained glass window. It was a really striking image. Do you want to say a little bit more about what you were working out in that process? Yeah, well, I, I really love the overlaps you get when you layer two colours together. So I was just exploring what kind of extra colours you would be creating by by um, making those overlaps. I mean, I didn't strictly then adhere to any rule I'd set myself. It was just part of the journey, really. Um, I was also interested because I um, actually made Pink Lion using household emulsion as well. It wasn't Little Green, it was uh, Dulux and Home Base. But um, it's very thick to put on. And I was wondering whether you dilute it at all or do you just do it straight from the jar? Sometimes I diluted it slightly. But I think that might have been more that my paints had been out for too long and it dried a little, you know, if they were yeah. brand new, they might have been all right. But yeah, it's very cloggy, isn't it? <laughs> it is a bit cloggy. <laughs> and were you using quite kind of um, chunky brushes? Because it's, there's quite a nice dry brush effect in some places and it lo- looks a little bit scratchy in a really good way. Yeah, I mean, it just depended on the size of the image. So like for my little tiny... Um, cooked breakfast I did have to use quite small brushes for that and that was quite tricky with the thick paints yeah because there's some of the scenes there's a lot of detail in there for for paint of that consistency you've also sent through a little animated sequence showing how you made the image of the bath do you want to tell us a little bit about what was going on there yeah so this is my favorite image in the book It just shows how, so when you do a screen print, for example, you do each layer separately, each colour separately. And I was trying to do that, but with the paints, with a light box, you're you're painting the image colours separately, but matching them up, but they don't quite match up, so then you get that lovely overlap. This animation just shows how how it builds and grows up. And you'll see that I have used throughout the book pencil detail there's a really it's a really distinctive um look that's kind of it feels the same family as your previous books but it's it's a a whole new departure really isn't it I I also noticed Nicola you've done some I don't know whether this is sponge printing or some other type of printing but the, the fence panels and things like that there's a lovely picture of your cat sitting on these fence panels and I was wondering how you made those Actually, I sent you the fence panels, not just because of the pussycat, but um, 
because that was an example of where I actually did the colour in Photoshop, which I never usually do. So I cut out stamps out of that thin rubber stuff you get from children's craft shops. Yeah. Stamped in black, but then colourised them in Photoshop and tried quite a few different colours before I got to the, the final colour. Oh, and that's a technique. Yeah, that's a technique. I've gone on to use a lot more, actually. Some of the images you sent through, there's some where you've got a painted background and then it looks as if you're experimenting with some collage as well. What's going on there? So this was just when I was kind of developing the characters. Um, and again, I find, um, I mean, if I wanted to be really sort of arty about it, I would say you're drawing with scissors when you're making collage. <laughs> And again, it's a way of freeing you up. So sometimes when you're developing a character, you can, if you're using very fine materials like pencil, for example, you can get a bit tense and worried and sort of intimidated into making it perfect. If you get scissors and start drawing with scissors and making collage, it just frees you up to be very playful, which I think is a really important part of developing a picture book. It does. That's why I love collage. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, it's the same with the layering of, of um, the way I've layered the colours. You just get these wonderful little mistakes that contribute to the overall look in a lovely, playful way. So, yeah, I was just playing with developing the, the characters. I mean, quite early on, I decided they were going to be dogs. Any particular it's really reason? Well, it's funny. Sometimes you just make a decision and it's just right and you don't know why. Um, certainly with this and my book, The Strongest Mum, my debut book, which was um, sort of similarly used metaphor to, uh, to demonstrate a kind of mental state in a way. So I think if, if the creatures in, if, if the characters in Grumpy Hat were people, it would actually be quite a sort of sad and heavy book because there's one image where Ravi is completely enclosed by the Grumpy Hat that's you know that's really really sad but if you have a dog it just removes it yeah a step from the child's own experience and brings this playful quality and i think that's why so many um children's picture books feature animals as the main characters because it just again it allows you to explore very real issues or emotions or experiences but it just takes it a step away which makes it more comfortable and enjoyable i think it really works with dogs just just right you sent through some pencil roughs that have been put into a sort of proper um printed form with the text in position and you've got lots of notes on there about color is that you're still making decisions about color at that stage yes so i was thinking about and I wanted each page to feel that it had a very different dominant colour. Um, so it was just planning out the kind of backgrounds, really. Yeah. And it's really interesting the first time you... Because you send your roughs to the designer, and the designer places all the text properly, because before that, it's just been my scribbled handwriting. And then you've got the printouts, and it's the first time it starts to look like a real book. It's an exciting stage, isn't it? Yeah. So can, can we talk a little bit about all the amazing household objects in the book? And I know you, you've told me before that you've got a special interest in domestic paraphernalia, I suppose we could call it, and that's got a connection to your mum. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? One of the things I love about lots of picture books is the importance in their sort of visual language of domestic detail. So... Um, think about classics like Peepo, which is the Janet and Alan Orberg book set in wartime Britain. And all the details. Oh, in fact, I've got an oxygen over there. <laughs> it's exactly like the one from that book. And, you know, when you're three, your world is your home. That, you know, that's, that is the extent of your world. So picture books have a chance to really celebrate that and when I did my MA I did my dissertation about the visual language of domestic paraphernalia in picture books 
So yeah, it's something that's very important to me in my own work. And so in the Grumpy Act, for example, there's a bentwood chair, which is based on a chair that I still have that was my mum's and which she drew because she was um, she was well, she was an early years head teacher and also an artist, so an influence on me in myriad of ways. I mean, unfortunately, she died. 20 years ago so she didn't see any of this happen for me but it's really lovely to be able to sort of folk these little tributes to her and this is said bentwood chair which i grew up with amazing well guess what i've got here nicola this was in my childhood bedroom oh my god it's literally <laughs> exactly <the same>. that <laughs> it's even got the same pattern on the base <laughs> Soulmates. Yeah. And you also have shown me um, some pages from your very first ever picture book that you made with your mum, which is really very impressive. Well, which, what age were you when you made it? I was five and she, I wrote the story with her. And then um, the aeroplane is my, my first book illustration. It's she a very good one. Me. And I always thought she should go into children's books um, but um so you've I, done it for her it yeah so nicola let's let's um talk about the cover of the book which is very simple but very striking and i can i mean i went to a kind of loved book fair before covid i went to a cover talk and it was about kind of um, covers of adult books so it wasn't really relevant to what we do but it really got me thinking. And I think previously I felt that the cover needed to sort of be a bit of a synopsis of the story. And with Grumpy Out, I realised, no, it's just got to be a lovely cover that we do want to look at in the bookshop. So I sort of, having been freed of this worry about needing to be like a kind of visual blurb, yeah, I was able to just be really simple with it. Although, funnily enough, it actually is a sort of synopsis of the story because Rappi has conquered his mood and is sitting on top of the hat and is no longer overwhelmed by it. So the story yeah. is all there. Yeah, but right. the colours are really jump out at you. And the title, Thank actually, I really like. Thank you very much. And Becky Carroll at Anderson, who's the designer there, is just, she's such a typographic genius. So it's been really fun working with her. And it's really interesting to see some of the earlier versions and the the different arrangements with the hat that you were you were trying out. But I yeah, think. there was quite a lot of discussion about whether the sister should be on the cover or not. I'm glad she is. Well, thank you so much, Nicola, for telling us all about the story behind Grumpy Hat. It's been really, really interesting, and I love the book. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. I'm going to end by showing you another picture book that's all about emotions. It's this one. In English it's called The Colour Monster, but I happen to have a copy in Spanish. It's by Anna Lenas and it's got some wonderfully creative pop-up in it. The emotions are depicted as these funny little monsters made of things like um, corrugated cardboard. Let's have a look inside. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed looking at picture books. I've got lots more exciting episodes planned over the coming months so make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any.